In an earlier book, Brain Droppings, I wrote some things about politically correct language, but I left out a few areas. I neglected three important groups of people who have had this awkward, dishonest language inflicted on them by liberals. I omitted those who are crippled, ugly, or stupid. And so, to address these earlier omissions, I'd like to make a brief return visit to that playground of guilty white liberals, political correctness. Political correctness is America's newest form of intolerance, and it's especially pernicious because it comes disguised as tolerance. It presents itself as fairness, yet attempts to restrict and control people's language with strict codes and rigid rules. I'm not sure that's the way to fight discrimination. I'm not sure silencing people or forcing them to alter their speech is the best method for solving problems that go much deeper than speech. Therefore, those among you who are more politically sensitive than the rest of us may wish to take a moment here to tighten up those sphincter muscles, because I'm going to inject a little realism into the dream world of politically correct speech, especially the words we use to describe one another. Perhaps you've noticed that when the politically correct liberal rule makers decide to rename a group of humans they view as victims, they begin by imparting a sense of shame to the group's existing name. And so somewhere over the years, the word cripple has been discarded. No one mentions cripples anymore. That's because in yet another stunning attempt to stand reality on its head, cripples have been assigned a new designation, the physically challenged. The use of physically challenged is an obvious attempt to make people feel better. The idea being, as long as we can't cure these people, let's give their condition a more positive name and maybe it'll distract everyone. It's verbal sleight of hand. The same is true of the ungainly phrase, differently abled. I believe that if a person is going to insist on using tortured language, such as differently abled, then he should be forced to use it to describe everyone. We're all differently abled. You can do things I can't do. I can do things you can't do. Barry Bonds can't play the cello. Yo-Yo Ma can't hit the curveball. They're differently abled. It should be explained to liberals, patiently, that crippled people don't require some heroic designation. It's a perfectly honorable condition. It appears in the Bible. Jesus healed the cripples. He didn't engage in rehabilitative strategies to improve the conditions of the physically disadvantaged. Can't these liberals hear how unattractive this language is, how poorly it sits on the ear? Personally, I prefer plain, descriptive language. For instance, and this is a suggestion that will bother some people, but I'm serious about it. Why don't we just call handicapped people defective? You know, we don't mind talking about birth defects. We don't flinch from that. We say Gunther has a birth defect. Isn't that a concession to the fact that people can be defective? Then what would be wrong with calling those people the physically defective? At what point in life does a person with a birth defect become a person who is differently abled? And why does it happen? I'm confused. Then there are those who don't quite measure up to society's accepted standards of physical attractiveness. The worst of that group are called ugly, or at least they used to be. The PC lingo cops have been working on this, too. And to demonstrate how far all this politically correct evasive language has gone, some psychologists are actually now referring to ugly people as those with severe appearance deficits. Okay? Severe appearance deficits. So tell me, psychologist, how well does that sort of language qualify for being in denial? These allegedly well-intentioned people have strayed so far from reality that it will not be a surprise for me to someday hear a rape victim referred to as an unwilling sperm recipient. Back to ugly. Regarding people's appearance, the political language police already have in place one comically distorted term, lookism. They say that when you judge a person, or rather size them up, wouldn't want to judge someone, that would be judgmental. If you take their looks into account, you're guilty of lookism. You're a lookist. And those valiant people who fight lookism, many of them unattractive themselves, tell us that one problem is that in our society, those who get to be called beautiful and those who are called ugly are determined 
by standards arbitrarily set by us. Somehow there's some fault attached to the idea that we, the people, are the ones who set the standards of beauty. Well, we're the ones who have to look at one another. So why shouldn't we be the ones who set the standards? I'm confused. I would say the whole thing was stupid, but that's my next topic, and it would sound like a cheap transition. So, stupid. It's important to face one thing about stupidity. We can't get away from it. It's all around us. It doesn't take a team of professional investigators to discover that there are stupid people in the world. Their presence and its effects speaks for itself. But where do these stupid people come from? Well, they come from American schools. But while they're attending these schools, they never identified as stupid. That comes later, when they grow up. When they're kids, you can't call them stupid, which may be contributing to the problem. Unfortunately, kids, stupid or otherwise, come under a sort of protective umbrella we've established that prevents them from being exposed to the real world until at 18 their parents spring them on the rest of us, full grown. There are stupid kids. And I do wish to be careful how I negotiate the minefield of the learning disabled and the developmentally disadvantaged. In other words, those with special needs. All of these being more examples of this tiresome and ridiculous language. I just want to talk about kids who are stupid, not the ones with dings. One of the terms now used to describe these stupid kids is minimally exceptional. Can you handle that? Minimally exceptional. Whatever happened to the old reliable explanation, the boy is slow. Was that so bad? Really? The boy is slow. Some of the other children are quick. They think quickly. Not this boy. He's slow. It seems humane enough to me. But no, he's minimally exceptional. How would you like to be told that about your child? He's minimally exceptional. Oh, thank God for that. We thought he was...